Hello, I'm Bob Fisher. I'm the president of the Nevada Broadcasters Association. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the annual Sun Youth Forum panel discussion. Uh, the Las Vegas Sun founder, Hank Greenspun and Ruthie Deskin, they believed that young people had something to say, in fact, something important to say. And because of that, they wanted to provide a, a podium, a forum, where students could come together and exchange ideas on a variety of issues. Since 1955, high school students have been doing just that. And recently, believe it or not, close to 1,000 junior and seniors uh, in high school the juniors and the seniors gathered at the Las Vegas Convention Center. And boy, was that fun. It was the Las Vegas Sun Youth Forum. Students were assigned uh, to groups where they, uh, they discussed topics ranging from jobs and social security to, uh, to drugs and, uh, and abortion. Finalists were uh, selected to summarize, in conclusion, uh, their group. And uh, they do it in a public forum. This is one of those public forums. So please join me uh, uh, to, uh, to meet nine of the best of the best. These are uh, the finalists uh, participating in this year's Sun Youth Forum, and I am so excited uh, because this is, a, not only is this a good group, it's the most we've ever had on stage, so we'll see what happens. Ahmed, uh, we're gonna start with you. Same question to everybody. Your name, your school, your class, and if you know what you wanna do for the rest of your life. Okay, I'm Ahmed Bhatti. I go to Green Valley High School. I am a junior this year, and unfortunately, as of right now, I do not know what I want to do with the rest of my life. Noah. I'm Noah Yaffe. I also go to Green Valley High School, and I'm a junior too. Um, same as Ahmed, I really have no idea what I'm going to be doing later in my life, as of now. So. Well, maybe because of the Sun Youth Forum, you will decide on a career today. Most definitely. Alex. <laughs> um, I'm Alexander Tin. I go to the Advanced Technologies Academy. I'm a senior, and I'm hoping to practice law one day. Aquila. I'm Aquila Ocean. I go to Canyon Springs High School. I am a senior, and I, too, am hoping to practice law one day. Anissa. My name is Anissa Waterhouse. I am a senior at Basic High School, and I'm going to jump on the law bandwagon and work my way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> Jaron. Uh, my name is Jaron Santos. I am from the Advanced Technologies Academy, and I am a senior, and hopefully one day, not on the law bandwagon. However, I do hope to practice nursing and maybe educate the world one day. Wow. Zach. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Sermach. I'm from West Korean Technical Academy. I'm studying business there as a junior and I hope maybe to take my uh, knowledge of business right now and move forward into the future with it. Hi, my name is Anna Ziai. I go to Coronado High School. I'm a senior and I'm also studying business at my school and I hope to go into corporate law. Riley? Um, I'm Riley Johnson. I'm a senior at ATEC with Alex and Jaron and I want to go into engineering one day. Why don't you give yourself some applause? <laughs> First time we've ever done it. It's, it's not on the script. I love it. Uh, we have a lot to discuss, but before we get started, uh, let's take a look at this past year's Sun Youth Forum, and it was great. It happens only once a year. They come from all over Clark County to the Las Vegas Sun Youth Forum. This year, more than 1,000 of the best and brightest high school juniors and seniors were selected to join the great debate, an opportunity to discuss the important issues of our day with peers and community leaders. As a community, it just enlightened us to like, just to know that we do have a future in debating or law, you know, things like that. I just think that it's really cool that like we get to actually have a voice when usually we don't. Good ideas circling around. I get to hear a lot of input from different schools and kids. And it's awesome. It's just a great opportunity for a whole bunch of good kids to get together and talk about important uh, things that are going on in their lives and in the world today. It's touching on issues that are relevant to them. It, it's making it something that they want to be involved with. They want to drive forward and create change. 
The topics tackled by these young minds were not in short supply. Let's talk about oil really quick. Condoms and birth control are like readily available. But alcohol is more dangerous than marijuana. If the action is going to be taken against Iran. I am for the death penalty. Not everyone's relationships are the same. People want social security. Wind power and solar power. So many jobs. You should know who your president is because who they are influences what they do. And while not everyone agreed on the issues, these future leaders were able to respect each other's opinions and one another. I don't feel like I'm abnormal now because I know people agree with what I, I'm thinking. I learned that I should, like, more, for one, research the topics more to get in depth to know, like, what everybody is talking about. And on top of that, just to learn to have an open mind and to accept different ideologies of what I believe or what others believe. I will definitely be back next year. What a great, great opening. And um, something we're going to do, which I think is going to be a lot of fun, we're actually, for the viewing audience, going to do a Sun Youth Forum. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it just like a Sun Youth Forum. So what I'm going to do is begin with one, one uh, of the finalists, ask you what your topic was, ask you what your group was like, and introduce the topic that you want to talk about, and then we're going to open it up to everybody. Don't be shy. And I really want to say before we get started that we film this at uh, UNLV TV and I love working with the folks at UNLV TV, the best. So Ahmed, we're going to start with you. Topic? All right, uh, my topic was around the world and basically was a discussion of different like foreign policy issues relating to like how we should react to like current political trends or uh, like little tensions that are rising in the Middle East, for example. Uh, our group itself was pretty split apart. It wasn't cited like too conservative or too liberal. We had uh, we had views from both spectrums, I guess, of uh, like both spectrums. And that being said, uh, one of the most controversial uh, with uh, heated debate, one of those uh, topics was whether or not we should withdraw the troops from Afghanistan. And I think that the year we gave was uh, 2014, and if that was a feasible date, and then we discussed advantages, disadvantages, and uh, how each individual uh, felt upon that issue. What did you think? And uh, I personally thought that, uh, that withdrawing would probably be a good thing, um, but probably not too realistic by 2014, specifically because of the fact that uh, there are uh, economists and politicians who write specifically about something called a power gap, and that's when you withdraw troops from uh, any area that's not stabilized yet or that does not have like a regional power set up. Uh, regional uh, tension breaks out and conflict begins to start again, whether that's uh, terrorists uh, arguing or fighting for power or political factions themselves. It's a question of how stable are we right now before we withdraw. And the fact is that uh, the stability is probably lacking specifically uh, due to the fact that there are individuals who are uh, still uh, high in their uh, terrorist powers, uh, controlling political tensions and uh, the political sphere, which is probably a reason as to why we should not withdraw before 2014. What an excellent, excellent introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, any reaction, any response? No, Ahmed, I wanted to ask you before we, we came on here, but I didn't get a chance. Um, did, did you say that you wanted to take out all of the troops or, and, leave, and not have the any troops? The discussion, yeah, the discussion was, should we withdraw entirely from Afghanistan okay. by 2014? And what were you thinking? And I said no, you said not no. by 2014. Okay. Uh, withdrawing troops uh, entirely might be a good idea, uh, at the, only at the point at which they've been entirely stabilized. And I said it was a good idea due to the fact that uh, cit individual citizens within, for example, Afghanistan and the, the rest of the Middle East uh, do not favor the United States intervention. and. Uh, the more we intervene, the more antagonism that arises, whether or not it's justified is an entirely different story. But mm -hmm. the fact is that we need to withdraw at some point to stop external conflict. But the question is, when can we withdraw fr mm -hmm. uh, from there? How would we measure that stability? Do you I have guess, any kind of gauge? Uh, that I guess stability is measured by like, whether or not we've set up a like, workable democracy. Um, at the point at which like, that democracy is still being like, conflicted over, where people are being blackmailed to vote uh, one way or being... Uh, like they're threatened for their lives, for their political views. I feel like that democracy is not set up. Something specifically we talked about was uh, currently, we related it actually back to Pakistan for a second, that there was an uh, individual, I'm pretty sure you've all heard about it, um, Malala, I think her name was, and she was just going to school and her bus was stopped by Taliban members and she was shot in the head for wanting to access education. And the fact that uh, the borders between Afghanistan and Pakistan allow for a spillover and crossover between uh, ideolo ideological differences and whatnot, uh, specifically like uh, Taliban members. I feel like the fact that things like this can still happen uh, is a reason as to why like, the stability is not there. 
uh, the, these people's mind, sh uh, mind, uh, mind shifts need to happen such that like within themselves they realize that there's an inherent value to uh, education for all, for example. Things like that probably are the best way to gauge whether or not it's stable. And I think I agree a lot with Ahmed because um, right now as if or our troops are the ones that are kind of keeping everything together. And if uh, the, the U.S. troops are all of a sudden gone, then that leaves an opportunity for a terrorist organization to rush in and, and take over, which would not be good for the people in Afghanistan or for us here in America. Uh, you mentioned the whole keeping everything together, and he talked about the fe feasibility of pulling out now. But I, I think the real question is, what's the feasibility of us actually creating a working, stable democracy through military power? Uh, is, is that something that is a goal that we can reach in five, 10, even 15 years, or is worth reaching. Yeah, I think what uh, Ahmed started out with talking about, you know, the stability of the region and how it might not be the best idea at the current time, uh, makes a lot of sense when he mentions the power grab and brings up, you know, other conflicts. But I think that, you know, what Alex, I think, was leading on to is that we need to be making not just an effort to be present there, but we also need in some way to focus on, you know, making more stability and providing more stability for the region instead of just saying, you know, when can we get the troops out? Because we've had, you know, date after date after date in the past where it's just not been done and nothing's really happened and it's because we have issues like that. So I think we need, well, the United States needs to sort of shift its focus along with it before we can, you know, see a feasible, you know, withdrawal from Afghanistan. Yeah, exactly. No, like making our time worthwhile there, maybe influencing them in a better way, exactly. So I think that's a good point. Yeah, I definitely agree with what you're all saying. But, well, with what Noah was saying, excuse me. But my question is, <laughs> why is our military over there trying to basically recreate an entire government? Um, is it really our job to be over there and dictating how they run their government? I know they have their own problems internationally, and America's the country who wants to give, 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 and give, but we have our own problems over here. And so, I'm not, I'm not very educated on military affairs, but if I... I think we should pull out because it's not our job to run other countries if we have troubles in our own country. And then when we start to concentrate on, let's say, how the government will work if we leave, then we start going away and straying from our focus of pulling the troops out. Because if we're trying to look for a realistic time of when to take the troops out, then how long would attaining stability take if we want them as soon as possible out of Afghanistan? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, sort of what you were going on is that, you know, we have problems in our own country. Why should we be worrying about, you know, uh, specific foreign affairs right now when we have so many issues we have to deal with ourselves? But I think that one thing we have to realize is that when we're there, I don't think it's our job to necessarily, you know, set up our own government and sort of, you know, force upon them, you know, the kind of rules and laws that we want to put upon them. Um, I think it's more left up to them to, you know, establish some sort of fair system, some sort of government. And I think that we should be aiding in that manner rather than just putting in whatever, you know, government structure we want to see over there. And then at that point, we need to be making those efforts so we can concentrate on issues back in the United States as well. Because, you know, our presence in Afghanistan and the Middle East in general um, causes, you know, so many problems for the U.S. that if we want to be fixing things coming back in the country, you know, we have to, you know, resolve what's going on there as well. Aquila, you have uh, an opinion? Yes, I have an opinion. Um, <laughs> I... <laughs> Why, you know, I understand, like, that was my point at one point, one point in time as to, you know, why would we go out fixing everyone's problems when we have problems of our own? But other people need help. And a part of the reason why America is so strong is because we have, we have gained, we worked hard. We don't have great relationship with everyone, but we work hard to get a good relationship with everyone, you know. We're helping them. We would want them to help us, you know. What if we really need them one day and we just left them and it's kind of like, well, wow, like, we have this respected idea, you know, America wants to help everybody. I mean, we're trying, but if we just leave, then it's like, we're not even making our time worthwhile. We've been there so long. Like, why are we going to leave, ha not, not accomplished done. anything? Yeah, no. All right, so Ahmed, time. your group talked about the theme, the topic? Around the world. Around the world. Yes. The issue of Afghanistan. How many of you, by a show of hands, feel, and your opinion was? That we should withdraw, but it's not feasible by 2014. You believe that we should withdraw, but it is not feasible by 2014. Please raise your hands. <laughs> okay. That's the Sun Youth Forum. Uh, Aquila, let's, let's, let's go with you. What's your, uh, what's your topic and what do you want to talk about? And, you know, they were pretty quiet during that first round, so right. hopefully you're going to spice things up. <laughs> okay, so my topic was school days. And um, it was a topic that I really liked. The opinions were very, 
it was a lot of mixed opinions and the fun thing about my group was everybody brought light to certain pros and cons that you didn't really think about. Um, but one of, another one of another controversial topic that we had was if school officials should be permitted to use evidence that they found outside of school from social networking sites or whatever. So if you post something on Facebook or you email somebody something, you know, should schools be allowed to come and use that to like, dis like you know, use that as disciplinary, disciplinary me disciplinary means. Are we talking about like, are we talking about cheating in school or are we talking about like fights like or, anything, or like marijuana? If, if there was like fights, that. you know, like someone's like, I want to blow up the school the next day, you know, like, is it, is it the school's, is, are they allowed to, you know, be looking through your stuff, you know, trying to get your information? There was mixed opinions, but my opinion on that was, I think it should be. I mean, as long as the school, it's related to school, if it's a public site, you put it out there anyway. So why can't you? No, I think that's a great point because uh, we, you know we uh, bullying was all, bullying was a major topic um, in our group that did cover that mm -hmm. about um, cyber bullying, and I think yeah. that schools do have um, you know an obligation to look you know look over and help people that are being bullied online, and they they can't they don't they won't know unless they are maybe you know having to check sometimes. So I think you know my opinion <coughs> would be the same as yours. You yeah. know, but and then, they should look. I mean, like weighing both sides, you don't want to be completely blind to the fact that that's like. True. That's dipping into your privacy. That's true. How you should come to school Monday and get RPC for a comment your friend left on Facebook. Sunday night. Yeah. Right. I think <laughs> I think Zach's Zach's right that I mean people already use the for bullying cases people already use the Facebook and the, the Twitter to bring stuff in and use that as evidence. So um, I don't know if I think the bullying is a different case if it comes to somewhere like um, what I don't know how to say this but we we always talk about like different assignments and. Um, on online and so is it should we have teachers looking at that or I think I mean like looking at it from a legal standpoint it's definitely goes and in, like dips into the area of the exclusionary rule so when we're looking at the fruit of the poisonous tree we see that the evidence that we find it's not found by like probable cause so they didn't have a reason to go look into your private life to find all this stuff however I think if a solution to the problem could be like if someone is trying to help their friend they're being bullied, bullied online or something they could bring it to the counselor therefore the counselor is not uh, sitting in such an authoritative position such as like the principal or something but they can still get something done help the person and get the problem resolved I was actually gonna go off something I was just talking about um, I think when it comes to you know schools monitoring you know online activity by students um, I guess to some degree they should be able to, but I don't think it should be ever something where, you know, they are in the position of the student with, you know, control of an account or something like that. I think anything that someone posts to Facebook or Twitter or wherever that is public to all and that anyone could see um, is, you know, it's fair game for the school to go and see that. They obviously could if they're just stumbling upon it. But when we talk about issues like bullying and stopping things like that, I think um, it shouldn't be the responsibility of the schools to just be you know, snooping around on there trying to figure out what people are doing. But I think if there's a serious problem, there's also a you know, uh, burden placed on the students themselves to go and yeah, you know, yeah. speak up about something like that if uh, it's occurring you know, a mm -hmm. lot and over and over again. Yeah, the students can't just be passive. Anissa, would you feel more comfortable in your classroom if your teacher had a gun? If my teacher had a gun, yeah. um, it depends on the teacher. I can definitely relate to this topic because um, at the beginning of this school year at Basic High School, there is a page that was posted um, targeting Basic High School scroll girls in a salacious manner. And I'm so glad that my school was monitoring um, Facebook and Twitter to know about this. Um, and it doesn't, I don't think it covers the exclusionary rule because when you're signing up for these websites, you're signing when you click that I agree and you don't read the disclaimer before, you are signing over your privacy rights. So if you don't lock your Facebook, you don't lock your Twitter, then anyone can see that. And so if this, it is the school's job to make sure you're safe. And if you want to get past that, there's kids posting in class. So if you have the time to post in class, why can't the schools look at it? And but see if someone gets in a fight out of the school's campus, then they're not going to be taken to the school for any kind of punishment. They're going to be taken into the law's hands. So if these people are posting these things with their private life at home, why should the school bring it into their hands? Well, I don't think the school can use that to target you, but you could also use that in evidence. If someone was posting about a fight on Facebook, don't you think it would be the school's job to notify someone else about that? Unless it involved the school, I don't think so, no. What if it involved the students in the school, you know, what if that fight was brought to the school 
I mean, well, for example, if like there was like a club or something, and the club had a Facebook page, and there was a fight on that Facebook page, then yeah, that should be brought to the school's attention, and they should regulate that. Regulate that. But if it's just a private student and they're having problems, then I think that should go into a more of a therapy aspect versus a criminal aspect that the school should delve into. I think there needs to be cause. I mean, I think there needs to be like a reason for the. I think that. If somebody says, hey, this is going on, then the school should be able to go in and look. Like, they shouldn't just mm -hmm. be monitoring, you know, just for anything. All right, so, Aquila, the, the, the topic? Right. Your topic? Yes. Oh, you want it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes. Hello, like, hello, hello. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, my topic is, should school officials be permitted, sorry, to, u to use um, disputes and other information from social networking sites? How do you vote? Yes. Yes. Yay. By a show of hands, how many of you agree uh, and, and say yes? What's like a so-so? Can I put like an asterisk on mine? Yeah, I was going to yeah. say. <laughs> oh, this is, now we're getting like the second <laughs> form. Vote over. Uh, the only thing I would, only thing I would say to the parents who are watching this show, it's a different world than we grew up in. It is a different world. <laughs> Alex, your turn. Okay. Well, um, my group's topic was America. And uh, we, we talked about a wide range of domestic issues. We talked about abortion and birth control, jobs and the economy. Um, but I think the biggest, most controversial topic in our group was the question of whether we should uh, cap spending on presidential and national campaigns. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but during the Sun Youth, we were in the middle of that mm -hmm. uh, big, nasty campaign, which I believe was one of the most expensive campaigns run in the history of the United oh, yeah. States, even adjusting for inflation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> so in our group, I think the general consensus was that uh, there should be caps, but it wasn't really a consensus because we were a pretty passionate group. Um, I will admit I'm a little biased. I am of the we should have caps on spending in campaigns. But again, it was a pretty contentious issue in our room. I guess my question is, why do you feel that way? Well, I would say that, well, two reasons. Number one, the amount of money being spent now, at least from the research I've done, has a distorting effect on the ability of someone to express their opinion in the public forum. Uncle Joe, sitting on a street corner, won't have the same ability to express his opinion as uh, Mr. Jaron, CEO of a Fortune 500 company, who's able to flood the airwaves with his information, with his experts, and with his beautifully put together commercials. So, okay, so is this a question of like why Uncle Joe cannot or doesn't have the ability to advertise or why he doesn't have access to information? Are we talking about... I'm asking like for clarification. Are we talking about the voters? Are we talking about... Either spending or which... On, yeah, like, on well, yeah, I think the biggest idea is that, number one, the access to information is distorted because for most people, they <coughs> go actively out and search out information. What about things like the library where like you have access to a, a wealth of education for free and you can access anything you want? What about... Why doesn't that... I guess my question is like, why doesn't that solve back for any of like your uh, your argument that says that like some people mm -hmm. influence way more with the access of money? They absolutely do, though. Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's almost ridiculous to believe that somehow everyone is going to be going to the library and researching. Although we would like that of the citizens of right. the United States, the fact is that doesn't happen. People are easily swayed by commercials. And while we're not saying that everyone's going to have an equal playing field, we're not saying that this is a fight we have to give up. Isn't it fair game, though, for each of the candidates, let's say, to raise their own money? Because the American dream, kind of, I would say, I'm going to go back to the American dream. Um, it's the opportunity for everyone to do as they please. Well, we're giving them the opportunity. However, the circumstances that they're given, that's on their own terms, you know? Because let's say, um, let's say with Uncle Joe, you, he doesn't get to raise popular. the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he doesn't you guys get to raise Uncle Joe? Money. Yeah. He doesn't get to raise the money and get the commercials out. However, we're still giving him the opportunity saying, yes, you can do this. And then uh, Mr. Jaron, which is very ironic, by the way, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he has all these commercials available to him. Now, he has the money, but don't we both give them the opportunity? It's just but the wait, circumstances. Exactly. Wait, are you giving them the equal opportunity? Because that's, that's what our not country equal. is based off of. That's like saying you can go to China, but you can't use So the wait, are you <laughs> asking to quantify equal opportunity? Because that's like asking to quantify freedom of speech. You don't have one freedom of speech, two freedom of speech. It's the fact that freedom of speech exists. You use your resources however you want to like manipulate that, but at the end of the day, everyone has freedom of speech. At the yeah, point at which you money. cap, at the point at which you cap something like how much you can spend on a political campaign, 
it's government intervention in like a free market capitalist society. Mm -hmm. Spend, spending money is free, is expressing your opinion. I mean, if I want to, you know, only wear a certain brand of clothing that, and I'm, sp I'm expressing my like, oh, I think this is the best. And so that's, I'm spending my money there. And if I'm spending my money on my own campaign, well, or somebody else's campaign, if I really want, you know, Mr. Jaron to win the presidential election, then I'm going to give him my money because of, it's my freedom of speech. It's what I want. So That's just I can using your resources. Express that. So you guys yeah. talked about government intervention in a free market capitalist world, but we have government government intervention already. We break up monopolies or trusts, and that's something that's not only has plenty of precedent, but that's something we've been doing for decades. And I think that same principle applies here. We can't allow one person to monopolize the airwaves with his or her opinion. Uh, we're not saying that we're going to limit him entirely, that he is going to have the exact same amount of time to talk in the airwaves as the other millions of people in the United States. But we're not saying that we have to allow that monopoly of the airwaves. Well, uh, I guess the fact is that like, since 1800s plus, uh, during the uh, age of industrialization, it's not that like we were breaking apart monopolies. We set up ways that monopolies could not rise in the first place. Second of all, I feel like there's a misconception that like suddenly by capping the amount of uh, money that we can spend in political campaigns, Common Uncle Joe will be able to advertise much more. He still has uh, the same amount of money that he has. It's not like he magically uh, gets more money. So by capping it, sure, we can't spend as much, but the main political parties, the main candidates who had that wealth are still going to be the ones who are influencing the most. So at the end of the day, this is just a principle of does the government interfere uh, to, I guess, look, to what degree will we allow the government to interfere? And something like this, I feel like it's a minuscule thing that like, uh, people might get like disturbed about whether or not like government intervention is a good thing or a bad thing because at the end of the day, uh, the money that you have, you're going to spend it. Even if you cap it, the people who have the money are still going to be heard the most. Well, See about, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. All right, okay. But what if we looked like this? What if there was no cap on money, but our um, the people we elected were using their money for the right reasons? Because we're all talking about ads and pictures and clothes and the awesome background. But how many, of our, how many issues did you guys listen to about Barack Obama and Mitt Romney? I know Barack Obama is black and Mitt Romney is a Mormon. What else do I know about them? Because they spend all this money advertising, but they're not using it for the right reasons. And the American voting system today, I think, is pathetic because we are voting for someone based off of what's popular, what other people are saying, what we're listening to on Fox News, not what the candidates believe. Um, we're also voting based off of Democrat and Republicans. Who has more money? Who has the more seats? Who has this? I think it's... It's the people, it's the people's job to be educated about this. And by using money to manipulate everything, we're giving our citizens the chance to just say, oh, he's got a lot of money. I, I see Mitt Romney a lot. He's got that commercial that abortion is horrible, so I'll vote for him. I have a question for you guys. Are you guys aware of the decision in the Citizens United versus the FEC that just came yes. out for 2010? So yes, pretty much for those of you guys that don't know, it's like, it's the super PACs they get to finally spend unlimitedly for a candidate, but they can't have any, you know, conversation with the candidate. They can't plan anything with the candidate. So I think it goes down to, do you think, Alex, I guess my question for you is mm -hmm. that these ads, once they're put in place, since there's so much more, there's so much more money to be spent on them, it's unlimited now. Do you think that the amount of ads that are put in place will cause people, instead of having a negative problem, to have people go and research these candidates since there's so many more negative ads out? for them to go and figure out what's going on and it'll push them to research? Or do you think it just has a negative effect on us? Uh, so technically, uh, when, when it's the super PAC spending their money and if they're not talking to the candidate, then how are you going to cap that? Because they're running their own independent ad. So No, no see, that's what we were talking about, uh, capping the amount of money spent by all the groups a at different levels, obviously, but right, all so the groups in the campaign. Vote? How would I vote? Yes. Well, I, I made it clear to me. I'm going to be voting for <coughs> capping okay. the amount of spending. By, uh, by a vote uh, of this group, how many of you would agree that it should be capped? Ooh, split. Well, no, I'm, all, I'm, only, I'm voting capping because it's, it's interesting because, you know, we're spe they're spending all this money on, you know, campaigning, which is obviously, you know, gr the, you know growing the hype about the, the campaigns. So I think it's just interesting, like, do you guys, what, what's going on, you know, in the, in the White House, you know, when they're, when they're campaigning? Is anything getting done, you know? And I was talking about this with a lot of people, you know, while they're campaigning, is it some, you know, some, what a distraction to what the president is doing or what, the or, when the or when the president, <laughs> not the obviously, but, you know, the candidates and, uh, you know, what they're doing in the way, like, I would see it as a distraction, and that's just my opinion. The, the only thing that I would be disappointed that, that maybe they discussed it in your group, it's not only the, the amount mm -hmm. of ads, the amount of money, but it's the truth in the ads. Yeah. And, and that is it's an issue that you, all of you, 
as you uh, continue to be involved in the process, maybe we'll be able to, to do something about. Noah, your turn. All right, so I was in the Home in Nevada group, and basically we just discussed issues pertaining, you know, specifically to Nevada, of course. You know, so we went over things like Yucca Mountain, uh, solar and wind energy, you know, things like that, prostitution, everyone really loved that one. <laughs> but, um, you know, what Isn't I noticed... funny you go from Yucca Mountain to prostitution? <laughs> Only yeah. in Nevada, huh? Only in Nevada. <laughs> so, um, one of the things I noticed about my group while we were talking is that everyone was, you know, really respectful of the other side. Like, at times we had, you know, very diverse opinions coming on, especially when we were talking about the topic I'm going to bring up in a few seconds. But, you know, everyone was respectful to each other and everyone was, you know, allowing others to speak but still coming back with their own arguments and still, you know, making a point, making a stance, and not just sort of backing down. So we really got a lot of good discussion throughout the time. And then one more quick thing about it is that our moderator asked us repeatedly, you know, how many of your parents feel the same way about this? And most of the time, about 90% of the kids said no. So it was, you know, it was good to see a lot of kids who were developing their own opinions and their own views on um, issues in the world rather than just, you know, having their views passed down by their parents. It was really interesting to see how they could develop that with such, you know, controversial things. So what I wanted to talk about... Something okay. real smooth and easy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's coming. All right, so um, I figured we would talk about same-sex marriage oh, because yeah. in our room, um, you know, we had a lot of controversy about it, I guess. I mean, there was definitely a majority going for same-sex marriage, but the arguments were getting, you know, heated when someone would go back and forth with another person. So I felt that, you know, it was one of the more interesting topics we talked about. We spent a lot of time on it. So personally, um, I agree with same-sex marriage. I believe that, you know, it's someone's choice. It's someone's, you know, life. They can make their decisions. And, you know, putting a restriction on things they can do simply because of, you know, they're this or they're that or whatever. It goes for things, you know, aside from same-sex marriage as well. You know, it's wrong. We should be letting people, you know, live their lives how they want to and, you know, have a freedom of choice in what they do. So. Okay. Okay, let me jump in here real quick. So my, uh, my church has, mm -hmm. we have the ability to issue marriage licenses in our temples, right? And if, if same-sex marriage is against our religion, then we lose the right, or the, then by, you know, by breaking the law, if they're not allowing same-sex marriages to be f performed there, then they will lose the ability to perform or to give marriage licenses. So is it fair that that happens, that then all of a sudden that you have to go get married in your religion and then go get married legally separately? Is it, is well, it fair? Um, I think that, I you know, you bring up the argument of religion, which a lot of people, you know, turn to on the opposing side. And what I think is that while people say, you know, oh, this goes against my beliefs, you know, I don't believe in this, I think that, you, you know, really. if we have to, there should be a sort of system where, you know, it's separated. You know, if you believe that same-sex marriage shouldn't be allowed, um, you know, don't involve yourself in it or don't get, you know, tied up in the issue. I think that, you know, you should leave people to do what they want. And if you believe the opposite, you know, go ahead and believe that. Like, that's fine to have your own opinions and whatnot. But I think it's better to not, you know, restrict people from doing things. And I think that, you know, something could be set up where if a church did believe that, maybe they wouldn't have to, you know, do those. Like, that sounds a little bit extreme when you're coming from the for same-sex marriage side. But I think that at this point, you know, anything we can do to advance the issue and, you know, allow this to happen will be for, you know, beneficial. I wanted to point out that in the recent elections where a lot of states did pass same-sex marriage, I don't know if it actually passed, but I know a lot of the proposals included an exception that said the state has to issue marriage licenses to everyone. But if churches wish to give out marriage licenses, they can choose to give it only to same-sex or only to heterogeneous or only to people of a certain height. They, they have the choice to choose who they're giving the marriage license to as long as the state's marriage license office is giving it to everyone. Oh, yeah, six, four. nope, nope, nope. Yep, too <laughs> short, <laughs> nope, and too tall. Yeah, they absolutely wouldn't say, you know, they wouldn't tell you who you can marry, like who you're allowed to marry in your church and not like marry a church because they can't do that. Obviously they wouldn't do that, there would be an, that exclusion. Mm -hmm. If we have those two separate systems like you were saying, you know, uh, um, I mean, I'm for same-sex marriages, but my question is, is it feasible? I mean, if we have two separate systems, let's say that one part of the system allows it, but then another part of the system doesn't, then how does that work? Like, oh, am I going to treat you this way? Am I going to treat you a different way? And those different views and those, the one being allowed, one being not allowed, they're going to be just interfering with each other, causing more conflict. I think, uh, it, it, I think uh, it depends a lot on if you view marriage as a religious institution or a legal institution. And that makes, I think, all the difference in the world to what side of the spectrum you follow Yeah, I think uh, Alex explained it pretty well, how, you know, the states issue the marriage licenses to anyone, and then if a church is, you know, going to 
you know, not allow some people to or whatnot, um, they can do that. But I think, you know, you will have these two opposing sides, but, you know, there's conflict in our everyday lives, and I think that it'll be better if, you know, one side isn't, you know, overpowering the other by not allowing right. same-sex marriage as opposed to both sides sort of being equal, whether or not they... Yeah, right. and looking at this from a strictly legal standpoint, um, it goes back to the same issues that they had with interracial marriage. I mean, 50 years ago, it was illegal for a white man to marry a black woman or a Mexican to marry a black person. It was, it was uncalled for. People were getting arrested for this. And, of course, now we live in a more liberal state where people aren't quite getting arrested, but how is interracial marriage <coughs> different from same-sex marriage, allowing two people not to get married just because they're different? And so I think legally there's nothing stopping same-sex same -sex marriage from becoming legal. The only issue, I think, is is this a state issue um, or is it or should we make it a federal issue? Actually, I think it's definitely a federal issue because right. of one reason, taxes. There are different tax benefits given to married people versus non-married people. There are different taxes given to families with married parents versus non-married parents. Of course, so commerce clause. And, and I think as long as taxes are influenced by marriage and the amount of people, the mm -hmm. amount of money people have to pay for taxes and that kind of stuff, it must be a federal issue because as long as you have this kind of patchwork of oh, you're married in one state but not married in this other state, yeah. but the taxes are the same across the entire country, I think that creates a problem. I agree with you saying it should be a federal issue, but for a different reason, I agree that it should be a federal issue because it's going to it's easier if it's uniform. It's either uniform yes or uniform no. It's going to be so much harder to recognize someone married in one state and then maybe not recognize it in the other or you having to go somewhere else to get married or you know not to get married and not being able to see your spouse in the hospital in one state because they don't recognize same-sex marriages as a marriage. It needs to be a uniform yes or a uniform no. So you, I guess the, the point is that well, I mean, like Alex said, it's, it, marriage licenses are given through states. And, you know, same mm -hmm. with driver's license, same with other things. So, um, like, I don't know if it should be necessarily a federal issue because it has, it has so much more to do with the states in terms of getting actually everything done. Mm -hmm. But I would say it's, it's already a federal issue because of DOMA, you know, the Defense of Marriage Act, because mm -hmm. that was already passed on the federal level and it already <coughs> regulates that aspect of uh, same gender versus opposing gender marriages. I think it's already a federal issue that needs to be addressed. So, um, how would you vote? Uh, for same-sex marriage. <laughs> All of you, uh, raise your hands if you agree with him um, that you would be in favor of it. For freedom. Can I get some more asterisks? I mm -hmm. stay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, the, why, the abstention, why, why, is, it, is it a difficult topic to, um, to discuss? I guess I kind of had a, have a battle because like I, like him, like my religion is kind of I look at it in a standpoint where I see both sides very, very equally. So I see that, oh, okay, let these people, you know, be, let them have, you know, their life they want and everything. But then again, I also see it as like, what if it interferes to the extent of, okay, tradition or the American way or things like that. So there's, all, then one may be stronger than the other. I'm not saying it's not, but for me, it's just kind of like a battle of, it's people's lives. So I'd rather see the duel play out besides, instead of participate in this particular subject, so. My thing is like living in America and claiming to be American, you're very, con like, if you're going against it, in some cases, like I see, like you be very contradicting. You know, you're claiming America and you're supporting it and you believe it's all it's for, but we're the land of opportunities and equality and success, but who are we to deprive someone of their rights to do something that might make them happy? Something that was brought up in ours is um, then like, I don't know, I thought it was ridiculous, but how they, how they have all the different situations of marriage that, were, that are illegal, right? So there's, you know, there's marrying underage that's illegal. There's, and so different things like uh, polygamy is illegal. But so why is that if you're, I mean, what if people want to do that? Do, they need, do, you, do you then extend the right to everybody else? I, so are, and I just think that's... Are you comparing same-sex marriage to the marriage of a, a dog or something? Mm -hmm. Like, people, that's, that's my yeah. point. I don't, I don't you think can't. It's even, I think he's just comparing... I'm just saying that, like, um, if you... If, yeah, it's the same. It's the same thing. Like people do what you want in your own yeah. life, but um, so do you grant the the marriage license to the people who want to practice polygamy? I see your point. Um, That's why. So, I'm like but the, see, the reasoning behind us banning polygamy and uh, underage marriage, I think, is different than us banning same-sex marriage. We ban uh, underage marriage because we don't think children are old enough to make the correct <laughs> judgment call on whether they can consent to being married, which is supposedly a lifetime commitment. And we ban and polygamy. Because. And, and we oppose <laughs> polygamy because of the whole idea of the legal ramifications of having <laughs> multiple spouses involved in one legal case of marriage. I think both of your arguments could also be applied to same-sex marriage as well. I think that's also why we ban that. 
So I think it's like... Tell me how it applies then. Well, I think same-sex marriage, when, once you like look into it from a, like how you said, like polygamy, like if we're letting these people do these things and we're like watching it all play out, like I guess polygamy, we look at it as you can't have all these wives because, what'd you say? You said just... It's too hard to legally... It's too oh, hard no, to the, whole, like, the whole idea is that it's you wrong, have right? multiple legal and this, interests. And this is right. a great example of <clears throat> your own groups because <laughs> you put something to bed and it keeps on going, mm -hmm. which, is, which is great. Anissa, let's listen uh, to what you have to say, your group. Well, I was in the teen topic groups, and I think I'm, I'm positive. I had one of the best discussion groups out there, and I owe a lot of that to my moderator, Edward Burns. Um, we covered so many things from the stereotypical like sex and drugs and teen pregnancy to the issues that are affecting me now, like college and tuition and everything. But the one thing that really hit us hard is something we can all, every teenager can relate to, is the topic of bullying. But the one thing, I mean, we all think bullying is bad, but the one thing that really made this discussion interesting was whether it was our job to keep concentrating on stopping the people that are bullying or start changing the idea of the people who are being bullied, which is a standpoint I've never really heard of before. But it came up as we need to teach these kids who are being bullied basically to boost their confidence and self-esteem so when they are being bullied, it won't be as bad. So what do you guys think of this. Teach them what quick. to do when they're being bullied, or <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> walk well, away. We all basically <laughs> agreed that it's bullying quick. will never stop. So, and we've spent hundreds of years trying to concentrate on stopping the bullies. <clears throat> and so, what if we change tide and start teaching children to be stronger and more self-sufficient well, against I this stuff? Like, uh, I'm not saying I agree with this, like but that second. was yeah. the twist on it. I feel like it might work for you know verbal abuse or something like that, but. In terms of like physical abuse, yeah. I don't know <laughs> what you can teach a kid. That's a lot less. I'll teach our children karate. Just to the <laughs> <laughs> karate, really yeah, the economy. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I really I like your really idea on thinking of it from a different view. But then you said because we're never going to stop bullying. I think that's the worst mentality that you can have. That's basically accepting that it's going to happen and accepting the fact that it's going to happen. So by overlooking that and saying, okay, well, that's going to happen, so let's just try a new way. I mean, it's a good idea to kind of come from a new way because our way's been so wrong, but we shouldn't give up on the fact. Like, saying it's going to happen is, is giving up on the fact. I, I think, think that you could come out, come out from two different directions. I mean, the, the stopping bullying, like the stopping the bullies is like probably the best, it's probably the, like the best case scenario. But in the event that that like, isn't working, and it's obviously not working that well, then we, I think that that's where she's coming from. That's like the, the what's like, next. We've tried so hard, and we don't know what to do, so... It's not, it's not saying stop, What's but next? try something well, yeah. else. I mean, there, yeah, there, we, you know, we all know that theory that the, you know, the bullies are the bu were the bullied, you know, so they're, the kids that are bu be, you know, bullying now, th these days were bullied, probably most likely bullied when they were you know, children. And I think maybe we do shift our focus to looking at these kids that are you know are the bullies now or or getting bullied so they don't they don't you know turn back in the future they don't look they don't look at their childhood and say well I was bullied now it's my turn you know we right. should look at those kids that are getting affected now you know help them grow stronger okay. and so they don't turn into things that we really don't want to see you know in the future and that that you know that cycle that, keeps conti yeah. Yeah, continues I, th I think helping the victims of bullying is really important really yeah important. obviously and, you know there's no silver bullet but mm. I think we still can't forget that you know we need to tolerate bullying the same way we tolerate sexual harassment in an adult workplace which mm. is no tolerance at all oh, yeah. so uh, I don't think it's worth it to stop fighting bullying all right so what is your what is <coughs> your uh, your vote um, I'm not quite sure on this one. I think that there needs to be a more effective way of tackling the issue of bullying than just trying to stop the bully. What that is, I'm not quite sure about yet, so that's why I'm here. Um, How well, do we vote? Uh, was, uh, it, was the question? Was yeah, I was going to say that. It's more of like just a discussion <laughs> topic. Than okay, anything. discussion yeah. topic. Yeah. Okay. All right, you're on, young man. All right. So um, with my group, we were uh, also like Aquila, we had school days, so we dealt a lot with the education with um, CCSD along with other districts in Nevada and how we should approach that. And what I find marvelous about this group is that we're coming from so many different backgrounds that diversify our topic and our discussion as well. So let's say if we were talking about the dropout rate, not only are we getting 
the perspective on kids that actually see the dropout rate, but we're also seeing them from like the higher standpoint, the lower standpoints, people that are impoverished, people that aren't, you know? And we get all those different standpoints where we really just come together on consensus, but sometimes we just can't because of just how um, different and unique our opinions are. I mean, sometimes our opinions are brought up to light, which really makes this such a great topic. But um, the topic that I do want to discuss with you about is um, one of these questions. It's actually, uh, should teachers be evaluated on their performance? Hmm. And then, um, um, like, evaluated on their performance. So I guess you could say that's where we started to talk about and discuss about um, how they should be evaluated, you know? Should um, students play a part in this? Yeah. Should just only teachers be seeing this? Should administration also play a part in this? Should it all be mixed together? And that's what we were kind of discussing and how it became a really heated topic because we wanted to talk about how we could play our part in there too. So you're saying in, in this sense that, so teachers being evaluated like people walking into their classrooms, watching them teach, observing them, and seeing how, how effective that teaching process is, Right, that's, that's what you're talking about in that evaluation that's sense. Way. Yeah, one way. that's one way. One way. Yeah. Well, I mean, I definitely think that all aspects, in order to get all you know aspects and um, views on how teachers are teaching and how effective it is, you would have to. You, it's necessary to get the students' ideas because you know that's the they're the kids that are getting they're you know getting they're the kids being taught and they're they're learning. So I think that a kid's um, opinion on how the teacher is teaching is absolutely necessary in the teacher evaluation process. All right, show of hands. How many of you feel that the education that you are getting is, I'm going to ask you to say good, fair, or excellent? How many of you feel that your education that you've gotten is good? Can we please yeah. yeah. You appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, it's better than not having any at all, so I mean, I appreciate what I have. But How I many of you feel it. that it is um, fair? How many feel that it's excellent? I With an asterisk. I think, kind of <laughs> I think this is a loaded question. Of course. <laughs> of course. I, I hate questions like that. Questions. Yeah. It's so unfair because I have some amazing teachers at school. Basic high school has saved my life. Now I came from Minnesota. And Soda. that is an amazing school system. Like, it's one of the top in the nation, down to Clark County, which is one of the lowest. <laughs> but I have some amazing yeah. 49, 49, yeah. 49, yeah. Actually. I've had. Does anyone know who's 50? So um, <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> Minnesota's <laughs> number four. Yeah. But the thing is, like, when I'm learning, what I was learning in Minnesota <laughs> was higher level thinking. But what I'm learning here at Basic is just simple life lessons. And it's because of the amazing teachers I've had. Now, granted, one of the best teachers I've ever had in my entire life. She has taught me so much. She has a 72% fail rate right now and she's under fire because she has students that are failing. Now, how is that possibly her fault yeah. over the students' fault? And that's what's messed up with our school district is that people are evaluating this numbers and statistics over what they're actually teaching us. And that's the discussion we've had too yeah. in our mm -hmm. um, in our groups because, I mean, it, it can't possibly be all the teacher's fault if she has a 72% fail rate. You know, with our environment and what the circumstances are for each child, um, they could be, we have that responsibility as students to also play our part. And then so we were trying to find the middle ground of where, mm -hmm. how can students play their part? How could teachers play their part? Because like, let's say if we were to give all the responsibility to the students. Well, we have a mm -hmm. very high dropout rate and a lot of delinquent kids that roam around in the city of Las Vegas. So then, if they were to, let's say, they hated all, just one teacher, then they could have their evaluations all towards a negative and then fire the teacher like we're that. Gonna, we're going to move on because I want to make sure that I get the last three in because we're almost running out of time, which is amazing. Okay. The, but it has just flown. <laughs> your turn. Your turn, Anna. Okay, so I had the group of Long Crime, and it was run by um, the Honorable Judge Sullivan, so it was very interesting, very heated, and something that was extremely controversial in my group was marijuana legalization, and we went over a lot of things like how if it's legalized, we can tax it, you know, just like Colorado and Washington are doing. We also went over how if it's legalized, less people will want to do it, just kind of out of the whole idea of, okay, if people get marijuana and it's finally available to them, then they won't want to do it anymore. A lot of people refuted that. They talked about how just because we can make a profit of, off something doesn't mean that it should be in front of our children, in front of our students, in front of, the, I guess, the public in general. 
And we also talked about how it's a gateway drug and we went over a lot of science on how it affects um, serotonin levels and um, dopamine levels in the brain and how it is going to be addicting for people. So mm -hmm. if you guys can focus on solutions for like, marijuana legalizations, that'd be like my ultimate goal. So. Oh, um, I think that one of the things that should be focused on a little bit more is that if it were to be legalized, would it be, you know, state by state or just like a one federal law? Because when we look at the legalization <coughs> of marijuana in Colorado and Washington right now, we see you know, the states allowing it, but the federal government can step in, mm -hmm. you know, whenever they want and interfere. So mm -hmm. if it's to go by state and it's still against federal law, then it'll be, whether someone agrees with it or not, you know, it'll be pointless to have done it anyway. And sort of at any time someone could, you know, unknowingly be arrested or uh, punished for, you know, marijuana use, even if in the state's legal. So I think that um, if anything, if we are going to legalize it, it should be more of a federal issue simply because of the fact that, you know, it's too confusing to go by state by state and it doesn't really accomplish anything in the eyes of the... How many of you feel it should be illegalized? Illegalized? Legalized. Legalized. <laughs> legalized. Federally? How many feel that it should be legalized? Federal. Yeah. Federal. 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 <laughs> interesting, interesting. Zach, your group. Oh, well, uh, I had Coleman, <laughs> Nevada, just like Noah. Um, and. My, I was just so pleased with uh, you know, my group and um, obviously honored to be <coughs> chosen. Um, and my group was really amazing because we all were just... Hey, uh, by the way, for so the viewing audience, I'm glad he said it. You really should be honored by being elected. And, and that is a tremendous compliment to every single one of you. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. No, 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 you're fine, you're fine. No, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone who voted for me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, but the serious thing was um, we just all were so, um, you know, unanimous in our, in our voice and our, our opinions. Um, we very rarely had any type of controversy over any topics, actually. Um, but one of the most passionately discussed topics was um, job creation in Nevada, which was amazing because... Um, I, I love the topic because we have, you know, these amazing schools that are opening, you know, career and technical academies. So, you know, I'm, I go to West Career and Technical Academy. And um, these schools have such amazing opportunities that I know many schools don't have. They prepare you. I'm in the business program. You know, kids are in engineering programs. And these are setting students up for the jobs that need to be available for them when they go, the, when they go to college or when they come out of college or after high school, whatever their plans are. Um, and I think that when we were talking about you know these schools they they really do prepare students for jobs and the Nevada the business the uh, businesses that are the uh, the community the business community needs to be aware of these students that are coming out of high schools with the this knowledge and these these, these abilities and has to be hiring them instead of you know keep, they're you know looking for people who have low less skills and they need to be looking at the schools that we have um, that are just doing a fantastic job so that's that's what my argument was so how did the Sun Youth Forum impact you? <coughs> I think the Sun Youth Forum was one of the most e amazing experiences I ever had. I actually almost didn't go because I'm 16th in ranking um, at my school, I, you know, my class rank, and she, my teacher, my English teacher, said she was only taking the top 15. So I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? I might not go to the Sun, sun Youth Forum, and then someone backed out. They made a big mistake. Um, and, and, I, and I got in, and I, and I, I loved it. It was great. I, I didn't even think I was going to be uh, represented. Uh, you know, when I, I became representative, so it was great. Zach, uh, O'Reilly, your, your topic? Okay, I had potpourri, so I basically had everything that they couldn't put into one of your guys' topics. Um, we had, <laughs> we had, we had same-sex marriage. We had stuff in education. We had stuff that goes through everything. Um, and our group was heated at times but I, I liked how we were all really respectful and um, we just kind of kept no one was no one left angry I guess um, so that's a good thing uh, the topic that uh, our most controversial topic was gay marriage but since we already went over that um, I think that the, the one of the most passionate topics that everybody ended up agreeing on was affirmative action and for what affirmative action is is um, giving students a bonus on like college application or college admissions um, just solely based on race so uh, somebody who has, who's in a minority will automatically have a boost over somebody who isn't. Mm -hmm. And um, we discussed about how that was, is it even moral to do that? Is it moral to do that? Um, and mm -hmm. we ended up saying that our group decided that it was not really moral to do it, but at <coughs> a point in our history it was. It was necessary and it was important, but now it's not as... Well, right. Before, and, well, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I like to re at one point in history it was, it was, kind of, it was kind of like an apology you know, like especially the minorities to all we've done to you, we see we're wrong, let me give you these extra boosts to make up for it. But now we're at pretty much generally a level playing field. And I mean, it's, I know 
I'm, I have a bias because obviously I might have a leg up in some situations because I'm black if you haven't noticed. <laughs> but um, I, I still don't think it's <laughs> right. I still don't think it's fair. You know, like if 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 me and someone else are are just as equal, I feel like they should find something else. Like if I get a spot, I want to know that it's because there was something about me that set me apart, like not here. because something I can't control, mm -hmm. like my race or my religion or something like that. And I think that from I, I'm against affirmative action, even though it, it's ironic because it may help me in some pl cases, like the right and moral thing is it's not fair. One thing, one just really quick, uh, one thing that I found interesting, I never thought of it before, um, it was one of the girls in our group who said who, she would be, you know, get a boost from affirmative action, but she said that it almost felt demeaning. Just mm -hmm. saying, do I need, do I really need a boost because I'm a minority? And mm -hmm. so that's one hundred percent. But then, no, like, the, wouldn't you the want, funny like, thing was no. what Riley said. He was like, you know, well, some kids, you know, walked away unhappy, <laughs> you know, and I was like, well, maybe some did. The guys who were running for representative and didn't really win, <laughs> you know what I mean? They yeah. probably were pretty unhappy. Ahmed, when you when you opened uh, <laughs> opened everything up, <laughs> what what was the Sun Youth Forum? What did it mean to you? Uh, I felt like it was a chance to gauge the opinions of like my peers because I don't think that anyone in school uh, like during the lunch table <coughs> discussions like decides to discuss politics or like their political views. There's uh, like kids things to discuss rather than like I, I feel at some point like these things might be more stimulating to the, uh, to the mind and whatnot. So at the point at which like the opportunity for the Sun Youth came in. It's an opportunity to like gauge uh, my peers and like uh, understand like how different people uh, view the different things that are happening around the world or in just w back home uh, in America, specifically Nevada, things like that. How about for you, Anna? I mean, like I know all students have this in them. Like every student is going to be able to talk about these topics, and they all have their opinion. And I think the Sun Youth Forum offer, offers an opportunity for us to get together and be like, "This is what I think. It's the same as my parents. It's different as my parents. Whatever it may be, and I'm going to fight for it." And I think that's honestly a beautiful thing. And it's it's and it was different from you know we're always hearing about you know the news and which adults are always covering these stories or giving their opinions and I think it was just so interesting to see all of these um, students you know fighting for the same cause they want to get their voice out and it's 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 great because I've never been in a situation where I've seen so many kids who know so much and are are so involved like you know maybe you know at my school I hang out with five kids that are very involved w with what they're doing and the others you know are, are not doing things but this was just you know, a thousand kids all just so involved in the community. It's unbelievable. It's like this, like a huge involvement. I want to, I want to thank, I want to thank all of you. Um, what a, what a great job. Uh, very, very thank special you. group. Thank, thank you. Bob. What Another a great job. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's all I can say is, uh, uh, thank you everybody. And, and thank you uh, for watching uh, the Sun Youth Forum. Thank you.